Hello everyone, my name is Anderson aka Charlie. In this video I will give you a tutorial walkthrough of the SAT practice test 1, the math section. So what can you expect from this video? Well, this session will give a detailed walkthrough of the math section of the SAT practice test 1, which comes from the official SAT suite of assessments, the link is in the description. The purpose of this session is to help you prepare for the math section of the SAT and timestamps are given for those of you who need it. Anyways. So before I go into it, I, I want to first go over my qualifications to to give this tutorial walkthrough of the SAT. Uh, here are my scores. I don't really need to go into detail on them. Um, you can see, and I also have qualifications with tutoring. I'm a volunteer tutor through this online tutoring platform known as Schoolhouse.World, and my transcript has the link to my transcript is in the description. Anyways, so why did I decide to make this video now? I know that math videos aren't the type of video I usually post, like I usually post gaming and meme videos, but I decided to make an SAT walkthrough tutorial just because why not? I mean, there's really no reason not to. And it's also because um, I'm looking for other types of content to put on my channel besides just gaming and memes, because like, I just want to make my channel more diverse and yeah. So the SAT math section breakdown. On the SAT math section, there will be... <clears throat> On, <clears throat> excuse me. On the SAT math section, there will be 58 total questions, and 20 of them will be the no calculator section, 38 will be in the calculator section, and this is the amount of time they give you. Um, the now, there are two question types. There's multiple choice, which is where you select like from multiple choices in this grid in, which is where you just like write in your answer, but like through the grid, if you know what I mean. Okay. You understand when you take it. Anyways, so the SAT questions are divided by four topics. Um, 19 questions are hard of algebra and so on. Now the thing is, these topic, uh, math topic names, they don't really mean much. They're just ways to, categor ways to categorize the questions, but they don't really mean much. You don't really have to worry about them. So without further ado, let's just get into the questions and uh, my explanation. So the SAT questions will start off as super easy, but they get harder and harder throughout the video, throughout the test. So anyways, so question one says, if x minus one, all of that over three is equal to k and k is three, what is the value of x? So this should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, basically you have x minus one over three is equal to k and you set k equal to three. You multiply, you just try to isolate x by multiplying 3 to both sides and adding 1 to both sides, which you get x equals 10, which is d. Now for question 2, for i being being the square root of negative 1, what is this sum? So imaginary numbers are uh, like a concept in math in which like they they apply in which you take square roots of negative numbers, which cannot be done in traditional mathematics. However, for the context of this problem, this is extraneous. This doesn't really matter, this part. For the context of this problem, you can just treat i as any variable, and you just add them as if they were a variable. So 7 plus 3i plus, in parentheses, negative 8 plus 9i. Um, you then do this in 7 plus 3i minus 8 plus 9i, you combine like terms, 7 and negative 8, 3i and 9i, and you get negative 1 plus 12i. So that's your answer. So questions 3 and 4, they're more just wordy, wordy problems that don't really require much calculation. They're just like really wordy. Um, question 3, you could like read through this. Um, I'm not going to, yeah. So basically, it's just understanding the words. Um, the, no, the total number of messages Armand and Tyrone sends would be, so Armand sends M text messages per hour for five hours. So M messages per hour for five hours. Therefore, five times M is the total number of messages Armand sent. And then Tyrone sent p text messages per hour for four hours, so four times p, so the answer is c. Oh, oops. Here. Now, for question four, Kathy is a repair technician for a phone company, yada, yada, yada. Um, 
So what is the meaning of the value 108 in this equation? Basically, P is the number of phones that she has left to fix, and D is the number of days that she has worked. So when D is equal to 0, P, P is 108, and as D goes up, P goes down. And basically the meaning of the value 108, this is just a word comprehension problem. You just gotta you just gotta isolate the 108 and uh, interpret what that means. So that means when D is zero, when the number of days she has worked is zero, you get P equals 108. So therefore 108 is the number of uh, cell phones she has, number of phones, sorry, not cell phones, just general phones, number of phones that she starts each week having to fix. So the answer is B. And also, if you use process of elimination, A, C, and D don't really make sense. So, yeah. <clears throat> Question five. It looks really messy, but it really isn't. Um, just look at the variables and just, like, you know, subtract normally. It, it, it may look super messy, but it really isn't. So, so you have this, this, these parentheses, which are positive. And in these parentheses, which is there's a minus sign, which are which means they're being subtracted. So you take x squared y minus 3y squared, excuse me, plus 5xy squared minus all of this. So you get minus negative x squared y, and then minus 3xy squared, and then minus negative 3y squared. And two negative signs become a positive, become a plus, and then you get here. And here you just gotta combine like terms. It looks super messy, but trust me, it, is, it isn't. So you have x squared y here, and x squared y here, you combine them. You have negative 3y squared here, and then 3y squared here, you combine them. You have a plus of 5xy squared, and minus 3xy squared, I mean, yeah, squared, so you combine them here. And then you just uh, add and subtract, and you know, you get a 2x squared y plus 2xy squared, which is c. Now it may look really messy, but really just treat each each of these as a variable, like if you know what I mean. Anyways, it's really not that messy. Anyway, so question six. So for question six, this model is is used to estimate the height of a boy in inches in terms of a boy's age between the ages of two or five. Based on the model, what's the estimated increase in inches for a boy's height each a each year? Again, mainly a word comprehension, a comprehension problem. So H is the height of the boy, A is the number of years. <clears throat> so basically it says so what is the estimated increase in inches for a boy's height each year? That means that means so for every increase in a by one, every time a increases by one, what does h increase by? So every time a increases by one, h increases by three. And the answer is a. It should be pretty self-explanatory. It's just, you could also graph it out to see that every time a increases by three, I mean, every time a increases by one, h increases by three, every time the age in years goes up by one, age goes up by three. Anyways, question seven. The formula above gives the monthly payment M needed to pay off a loan of P dollars at R percent annual interest overnight in months. Which of the following gives P in terms of M, R, and N? So again, this equation also looks super, super messy. However, it's really not. Basically, you have M equals all of this messy stuff times P. So your goal is to isolate P, take P, get P in terms of the other variables. So you have this, and first what I do is uh, I divide both sides by this, the, this side, the numerator of the right side of the equation. So I get M over this equals one over this, and then I multiply the denominator by both sides. Like the, I multiply the denominator of the right hand side to both sides, and I ended, and I end up getting this. So, yes, it does look super messy, but it's really not. And that's how you get the answer B. You just gotta multiply both sides. You just gotta isolate P. And 
Also, you don't really have to look at all of this and be perplexed by it, because like, it's it's not that like it's not something to be too confused by. Anyway, question eight: If a over b equals two, what is the value of a four b over a? So there are many ways to approach this problem. Um, the way I like to approach this problem is to first take a over b equals two, which is also equal to two over one, and then I flip both sides. So I take the reciprocal of both sides. So the reciprocal, the multiplicative inverse reciprocal, I take the reciprocal of both sides. So from the reciprocal of a over b is b over a, and the reciprocal of two over one is one over two. And then I multiply four to both sides, and I get four b over a is equal to four over two, which is two. And the answer is c. I mean, sorry, sorry. Well, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. The answer is c. Okay, I, uh, why, why, why do I? Sorry, I cannot speak right now. I, I don't know why. Anyways, so um, excuse me. Um. Anyway, I'm back. So question nine gives you a system of equations, and what is the solution x y to the system of equations above? So the syst this system of equations is uh, you. There are many ways to solve it, as always. The way I solved it is that uh, um, what I do is uh, I first uh, you can take x in terms of y. So I take the second equation, two y minus x equals negative nineteen. And then um, what I do is I add x to both sides and also add a 19 to both sides. So I end up getting 2y plus 19 equals x. And then now I know that x is equal to 2y plus, ni plus 19. I take this equation and I substitute that in for x. So 3x plus 4y equals negative 23. I know that x is equal to 2y plus 19. So I substitute in 2y plus 19 for x and I get this. And then I distribute the 3 times 2y and 3 times 19, and I get this. And then uh, 6y plus 4y equals, uh, equals 10y, and I subtract 57 from both sides, I simplify, and I end up getting 10y equals negative 80, so y equals negative 8. <coughs> now, now that I know that y equals negative 8, let's go back to this equation, 2y minus x equals negative 19, and I substitute a negative 8 for y. So 2 times negative 8 minus x is equal to negative 19. 2 times negative 8 is negative 16. Negative 16 minus x equals negative 19. Um, I, so what I do is I multiply both sides by negative 1 to get 16 plus x is equal to 19, and I subtract both sides by 16 to get x equals 3. Now, there are many ways you could simplify this expression, that's how I did it, um, yeah. So therefore, x is equal to 3, y is equal to negative 8, so x, y is 3 and negative 8. So the answer is b. For question 10, for the function g defined above, a is a constant and g of 4 equals 8. What is the value of g of negative 4? So, basically, g... A function takes an input, which is x in this case, and it spits out an output. So in this case, g of x is equal to ax plus 24. Now, of course, you don't know what a is. Now, you know that g of 4 is equal to, so with x being equal to 4, g of 4, you just uh, substitute in 4 for the x. So you know that g of 4 is equal to 8, and you know that g of 4 is equal to a times x squared plus 24, x being 4. So therefore, in, since you know that g of 4 equals 8, and since you know that g of 4 equals a times 4 squared plus 24, you can set these two equal to each other and solve for a. And what you do is uh, you like take a times 4 squared equals 16a, and then subtract 24 from both sides, divide both sides by 16, you get a equals negative 1. So now that you know that a equals negative 1, we can say that the g of x is equal to negative x squared plus 24. Basically, a is negative 1. So instead of ax squared plus 24, it's negative 1 times x squared plus 24. So negative x squared plus 24. And then you know that uh, and it, it asks what's the value of uh, g of negative 4. So you have uh, g of negative 4 is equal to negative 
negative 4 squared plus 24 and you simplify this and you end up getting 8. So now of course with this method with the method I did you could do this to solve any to solve any problem like this. However, in the context of this problem, there's a much quicker way to solve it in the sense that if you notice that the x squared, it doesn't matter if x is positive or negative since the only x in the since the only time x appears in the output of the function is x squared and since in sense that anything squared, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. If you square it, it becomes the same thing. That means uh, that means the g of n is equal to g of negative n. So since you know g of four is eight, you can just say that the g of negative four is also eight, because like the function is even, since g of negative x is equal to g of x. Now of course this uh, doesn't always work, but it's important. But I think I feel like it's important to point this out because you can definitely do this for some problems. Um, yeah. Anyway, next in the equations above, B and C represent the price per pound in dollars of beef and chicken, respectively, x weeks after July first during last summer. What was the price per pound of beef when it was equal to the price per pound of chicken? So B represents the price per pound in dollars of beef. C represents chicken. Basically, you have to set them equal to each other because that's when the price per pound of beef is equal to the price per pound of chicken. So you set B and C equal to each other. You set D, this and this equal to each other. And then you just solve it. So here I subtract 0.25x from both sides and I subtract 1.75 from both sides. And I then uh, just do some more simplification and I get x equals 4. So now that I know that x equals 4, that means after 4 weeks the, the price of beef and chicken are the same. I then substitute in the 4 into this equation because that's the price of beef 4 weeks after the... That's the price of beef 4 weeks after, after July 1st. So, and then this is equivalent to 3.35, so there I get the answer, D, 3.35. Question 12. A line in the xy plane passes through the origin and has a slope of 1 over 7. Which of the following points lies on the line? So, the line passes through the origin, which is 0, 0, and it has a slope of 1 over 7. So, what that means is that when x goes up by... 1, y goes up by 1 over 7. That's what the slope of a line means. So the, the equation of a line is y equals mx plus b, and in this case it passes through the origin, meaning that its, uh, its y-intercept is 0, so it's just y equals mx, and its the slope is 1 over 7, so y equals 1 over 7x. And then here you can just look at the four answer choices and see which one fits. So with this one, this being so for question B, it's for quest, for for answer B, it's x equals one, y equals seven. Doesn't work. For answer A, y, x equals zero, y equals seven. Doesn't work. Answer C doesn't work, and answer D works because for answer D, x equals fourteen, y equals two, and that works. Basically, when when the line passes through the origin, it has a slope of one over seven. That means that you know you know that like that uh, x has to be 7 times greater than y. So if x is greater than 3, which of the following is equivalent to this thingy? Um, yeah, it's really messy and it may look intimidating and it indeed is intimidating. So the way to solve this is you have this thingy 1 over this and the way I solved it, and of course there are different methods, um, I'm sure there are some people who have better methods, if you have a better method, feel free to leave it in the comments. So what I do is I multiply both the numerator and the denominator by this, by x plus 2 in parentheses times x plus 3 in parentheses. So I multiply both the numerator and the denominator by this, and I get this, and down here I get uh, 1 over x plus 2 plus 1 over x plus 3 in parentheses times x plus 2 and then times x plus 3. 
So I can distribute the x plus 2 times x plus 3, I can distribute this to the two fractions here. So I so for the lower, the denominator of this whole expression, I get x plus 2 times x plus 3 over x plus 2 plus x plus 2 times x plus 3 over x plus 3, which is like, you know, this thing. Um, this thing, I distribute this to these two fractions. And for the top side, I FOIL. Okay, I, I really don't like the name FOIL, but like, you know what I mean, right? It's where you do x times x plus x times 3 plus 2 times x plus 2 times 3. So it's x squared plus 5x plus 6. Um, so that's how I got the top side. Now here, in these two fractions, the x plus 2 in the denominator cancels out with the x plus 2 in the numerator, and the x plus 3 in the denominator cancels out with the x plus 3 in the numerator, and you end up getting this. Um, and then you can rearrange this equation, so you have x plus 3 plus uh, x plus 2 in the denominator, that becomes 2x plus 5, and that's how you end up getting the answer choice B. Now this problem is definitely a very hard problem for the SAT, but it's not that it's not as hard as it is tedious. So, yeah. Now if you if you ever feel like you are taking too much time on a problem, you could always skip it and come back to it later, or just skip it overall. Um, well, I wouldn't recommend that, but like, you get the point, right? Question 14. If 3x minus y equals 12, what is the value of 8 to the x over 2 to the y? So here you have 3x minus y equals 12, and you can rearrange this to get 3x minus 12 equals y, and therefore you, so you know that y is equal to 3x minus 12. So you can take this expression, 8 to the x over 2 to the y, and then you, you know what y is equal to in terms of x, so you can substitute 3x minus 12, you can substitute that in for y. So you get 8 to the x over, over 2 to the 3x minus 12. And nextly, you know that 8 is equal to 2 to the third power, 2 cubed, because 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, so you can take 2 to the 3 in parentheses, make sure you have parentheses, to the x over 2 to the 3x minus 12. And then since this is 2 to the 3 in parentheses, then to the x, you can multiply them together to get 2 to the 3x over 2 to the 3x minus 12. And now since you have this divided by this, so you have 2 to the something divided by 2 to the something else. So with these exponents, you can subtract. So then you can do, so you can, so you subtract the 3x minus 12 from 3x because you are dividing exponents. So you get 2 to the 3x minus 3x minus 12. Um, the minus, subtracting the stuff in the parentheses ends up you, excuse me, ends up you getting 3x minus 3x plus 12 and you end up getting 2 to the 12. So the answer is A. Question 5. If ax plus 2 times bx plus 7 is equal to 15x squared plus cx plus 14 for all possible value for all values of a and a plus b is equal to 8 what are two possible values for c this is a pretty tough problem but again it's not as tough as it is tedious so first you foil i don't really like using the name foil but like you get how it works for, so you have a, ax times bx plus ax times 7 plus 2 times bx plus 2 times 7. So here you get abx squared plus 7ax plus 2bx plus 14. And you know that a plus b is equal to 8. So therefore you can take this as 7ax plus 2bx and you can say that you can say that that is equal to cx. Because, like, oh, because, how do I say this? Because, like, when you FOIL this, when you FOIL AX plus 2 times BX plus 7, you get this. 
And it also tells you it's equal to this, equal to 15x squared plus cx plus 14. So you set these two equal to each other. Now, in this part of the equation, that there's only one x squared. So the x squared, there's only one term that has the coefficient of x squared. So this abx squared has to correspond to this 15x squared. So abx squared equals 15x squared. Now, this 7ax plus 2bx, so this this uh, expression has two x's, it has a 7 a, it has two terms that have a coefficient of x, it has a 7ax and 2bx, and this side of the equation only has one term that has a coefficient of x, which is cx. So you take the parts of the equation that have coefficients of x, and you get 7ax plus 2bx equals cx, you divide x from both sides, and you can say that 7a plus 2b equals c. All right. So now, here you know a plus b is equal to 8. So you subtract b from both sides, you get a is equal to 8 minus b, and b is equal to 8 minus a. So now also, you know that ab is equal to 15, because you have ab x squared equals 15 x squared, divide x squared from both sides, you get ab equals 15. So ab equals 15, and since you know that a is equal to 8 minus b, you can substitute 8 minus b in for a, and you get 8 minus b in parentheses times b equals 15. So you have negative b squared plus 8b equals 15, and then you can move everything to the right, and you get a 0 equals b squared minus 8b plus 15, and here you can use the quadratic formula. And the quadratic formula is basically where you have a quadratic equation. You can substitute in the a, b, and c, and you get x. Um, basically, just use the quadratic formula, um, and you end up getting a is equal to 4 plus or minus 1. So that means a is equal to 3 or 5. Now, you know that a, b has to be equal to 15. So therefore, a, b is equal to 3, 5, or 5, 3. Now, also, it asks what are two possible values for c, not possible values for a, b. So what that means is that, well, since you know that c is equal to 7a plus 2b, you can take 7a plus 2b and, and take the two possible values for a and b, and you end up getting 31 and 41. So 31, 41. This question is definitely very hard, and uh, um, it, especially if you're like, like in, in middle school, you might not fully understand this question. So you, so like, you don't really have to worry too much because like most questions on the SAT wouldn't really be that hard. But anyways, let's go on. Question 16 says, if t is greater than zero and t squared minus four is equal to zero, what is the value of t? So it's pretty simple. You just uh, have to get t by itself. So t squared minus 4 equals to 0, you add 4 to both sides, and then you take the square root of both sides. So t actually has two square roots, 2 and negative 2, but on, in the context of this problem, t cannot be negative 2, it can only be 2, because t is greater than 0. So, t is, so the answer is 2 for question 16. Question 17. A summer camp counselor wants to find the length x in feet across a lake as represented in the stretch above. The lengths represented by AB, EB, BD, and CD on the sketch were determined to be 1,800 feet, 1,400 feet, 700 feet, and 800 feet respectively. Segments AC and DE intersect at B, and angle AEB and CBD have the same measure. What is the value of x? Basically, First, let's redraw this uh, sim this uh, this diagram, but without the really confusing and like the lake thingy. The shape of the lake doesn't really matter. It's just there to throw you off. Anyway, so it's just asking you the, for the length of the the lake, which is A E, and uh, so it's asking you what is A E. Now, also, it gives you the lengths of A, B, E, B, B, D, and C, D, so we can write down the lengths. A, B is 1800, B, D is 700, B, E is 1400, and C, D is 800. So this is uh, mainly a geometry problem. You have to apply principles of geometry, and um, 
The principles of geometry that we can apply here are as follows. So you know that this angle and this angle have to be the same because these are two opposite angles of intersecting lines. So these two angles have to be the same. And it also gives you that this angle and this angle is the same because like it gives you this, like the angle symbol, the same angle symbol for these two angles. So you know that these two angles are the same. And since you know that the uh, two angles, so like you have this triangle, you have triangle BDC, you also have triangle ABE. You know that these two triangles have two of the same angles. So therefore you can say they are similar triangles in that all three angles of the triangles are the same. And with similar triangles, you know that the ratio of the side lengths have to be the same. As in the, the ratio of the corresponding, the ratio of the length of the corresponding sides have to be the same. So AB side length is 1800. So you know that AB is equal to twice BC. Now, cause like, cause like here's the thing with the tri with these two triangles, you know that EB and BD are corresponding sides. And since EB, the side in the bigger triangle is twice the length of the side in the smaller triangle, then you know that the the side length of every side in the bigger triangle is twice the side length of every side in the smaller triangle. So you know that DC is equal to one half AE. And since you know that DC is equal, cause like, you know, DC is corresponding to AE. And since you know that DC is equal to 800, and since AE is twice that, then AE must be 1600. And that's what they ask you. They ask you, what is the length of AE? Um, yeah, so the answer is 1600, 1600. Next, according to the system of equations above, what is the value of x? So there are many ways to solve a system of equations as usual. Um, I'm just gonna solve it the way I see is the quickest. So you have x plus y equals negative nine and x plus two y equals negative 25. You can subtract one equation from another equation and you get a val and you get an equation that's true. So what I do is I subtract the top equation from the bottom equation. So I get x plus two y minus x plus y equals negative 25 minus negative nine. And then I combine like terms and uh, it all simplifies to y equals negative 16. So therefore, since I know that y is equal to negative 16, I can go back to this equation, x plus y equals negative nine, y is negative 16, so x minus 16 is equal to negative 9, and I add 16, so x is equal to 7. Now, there's another way to solve it, and um, the other way to solve it, you can see here, it's basically where you solve for x in terms of y, and then you substitute in the, the, y, the terms of y for x, and you solve for y, but, and then you go back here, but like, you know, that, that method is a lot slower, so but like, whatever floats your boat, I guess. Next, question 19. In a right triangle, one angle measures x degrees, where sine of x is equal to four over five. What is cosine 90 degrees minus x degrees? So, cosine 90 degrees minus x degrees is four over five because of a simple rule where sine, so basically cosine of 90 minus x is the same as the sine of x, all right? cosine of 90 minus x is equal to sine of x in degrees. That's when you're in degrees. Now, so this is a really handy rule that can help you, but let's say you don't know this rule. Well, you can draw a right, you can draw a triangle and set and imagine one of the angles is x degrees. So since the sine of x is equal to four over five, that means the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse is four over five. So the angle is X, this is the angle, this is the opposite side, this is the hypotenuse. So since you know that the ratio of the opposite to the hypotenuse is four over five, then you can draw this right triangle. And then cosine of that, cosine of 90 minus X, you know that this angle is 90 minus X because the three angles in a triangle have to add up to 180. 
So therefore, since this is x, this is 90. Therefore, this must be 90 minus x, so that the three angles in the triangle add up to 180. Anyway, so cosine of this is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, which is this side 4 over 5. So it's 4 over 5. We're on to the last question of the, of the no calculator section of the SAT. If a is equal to 5 times root 2 and 2a is equal to root 2x, what is the value of x? So this question is actually not that hard. You know that a is equal to 5 root 2, so therefore, and you have this e e equation, so you just substitute a in the value of a into this e e equation. So 5 root 2 equals a, you substitute that in for a, and you end up getting this. You end up getting 2 times uh, a, which is 5 root 2. 2 times 5 root 2 is equal to root 2x. And um, 2 times that, that becomes 10 times uh, root 2 equals root 2x. And here you can take the root 2x and you can change that into root 2 times root x, that these are the same thing. And then divide root 2 from both sides and you get 10 is equal to root x. You square both sides to get 100 is equal, is equal to x. And there you have your answer, 100 equals x. So this sums it up for the no calculator section of the SAT Math Exam 1. I will now begin the calculator allowed section of the SAT Math Practice Exam 1. So the, in this section you are allowed to use a calculator. Um, I, you don't really need to use a calculator, but a calculator can definitely help. Anyway. So for the for these questions, I'm gonna go a little faster through them because like you can use a calculator, so like I don't have to like go too in detail step by step. All right, John runs at different speeds as part of his training program. The graph shows the target heart rate at different times during the workout. On which interval is the target heart rate strictly increasing then strictly decreasing? So strictly increasing means only increasing, and then strictly decreasing means only decreasing. So at what point is it strictly increasing and then strictly decreasing? The answer is B, between 40 and 60 minutes. So between 40 and 60 minutes, the heart rate is strictly going up, strictly going up, and then strictly going down. Right. Question two. If y equals kx, where k is a constant, and y equals 24 when, six equals, when x equals 6, what is the value of y when x equals 5? So here you just solve for k, y equals kx, y is equal to 24 when x is equal to 6, so 24 equals k times 6, therefore 4 equal, is equal to, to k, you divide 6 from both sides, 4 is equal to k. Now since you know what k is equal to, you get you go back to y equals kx, you substitute in you substitute in 5, <clears throat> you substitute in 5 for x, and you know that k is equal to 4, so y equals 4x, and x is equal to 5, so y equals 4 times 5, and y equals 20, the answer is c. In the figure above, lines L and M are parallel and the lines S and T are parallel. If the measure of angle 1 is 35 degrees, what is the measure of angle 2? So, the angle of measure 1 is 35 degrees. Now, angle 1 and this angle, you see this angle, these two angles are complementary. So, I mean, sorry, supplementary. I yeah. So basically, these two angles add up to 180 degrees because they go along a straight line. So they add up to 180 degrees. So since angle one is 35 degrees, therefore this angle has to be 180 minus 35 degrees, which is 145 degrees. Also, this angle is, uh, is the same measure as this angle because they are corresponding angles. Remember that these two lines are parallel and these two lines are parallel. Therefore, corresponding angles are the same. So this angle being 145, this angle is the same, also 145. Therefore, angle 2, since angle 2 is also corresponding, angle 2 also has to be 145. So the answer is D, 145. Question 4. If a 16 plus a 4x is 10 more than 14, what is the value of 8x? 
So 10 more than 14, that's a really weird way of saying 10 plus 14. So 16 plus 4x equals 10 plus 14, therefore it's equal to 24. Subtract 16 from both sides, divide, divide, multiply 2 to both sides, and you get 8x, which that is what they're asking for. They're asking for the value of 8x. 8x equals 16. The answer is C. Question 5. Which of the following graphs the best shows a strong negative association between D and T? So a negative association means that they are inversely proportional, or well, not necessarily proportional, but like, but like they are like, like that means as one variable goes up, the other variable goes down. So therefore, negative slope. Basically, as d goes up, t would go down. So this can already rule out b because I have no in c because I have no idea what like yeah, and so your answer choices are a and d. Remember, as d goes up, t has to go down. In answer choice A, it's not really a strong association. Like, there is a correlation between D and T, but it's not really that strong. Where in question, where in answer D, the correlation between D and T is much stronger, as in D is a much better predictor of T. So the answer is D. Question 6. A hospital stores one type of medicine in a 2 decagram container. Based on information given in the box above, how many 1 milligram doses are there in one 2 decagram container? So the container is 2 decagrams. And 1 decagram is equal to 10 grams. 1 gram is equal to 1000 milligrams. So you have 2 decagrams of medicine. Each deca so you have two, two decagrams of medicine. Each decagram is equal to 10 grams, so times 10. And each gram is equal to 1,000 1, milligrams, so times 1,000. And you get 20,000. The answer is D. The number of rooftops with solar panel installations in five cities is shown in the graph above. If the total number of installations is 27,500, what is an appro appropriate label for the vertical axis of the graph? So the total number of installations is 27,500. And what is the appropriate label for the vertical axis of the graph? So that means like, what should be the label for the vertical axis? Well, obviously the answer is C, because you know, cause like that is the only label that makes sense. And to say, and another way to put it is that, so, a is 9, B is 5, C is 6, D is 4, E is 3, they add up to 27.5. So these four columns add up to 27.5. However, the number of installations is 27,500, which is 1,000 greater than 27.5, which is 1,000 times 27.5. So therefore, that means the number of installations have to be in thousands. Because that's the only answer that makes sense and uh, actually fits. Anyway, so, like, if you get what I mean, yeah, do you, oh wait, this is a YouTube video, you, yeah, it's not interactive, um, in, like, it's not like where students can actively interact. Anyways, but I hope you get what I mean. Anyway, question eight, for what value of n is the absolute value of n minus one plus one equal to zero? So absolute value of n minus 1 plus 1 equal, is equal to 0. So there is no such value of n because the absolute value of n minus 1, the absolute value of anything has to be positive. Like absolute value of anything has to be positive. So so you can refer so and then you have plus 1. If you subtract 1 from both sides, you get absolute value of n minus 1 is equal to negative 1. And you can't get a negative number from an absolute value, so there's no such value of n. Answer is D. 9 and 10 refer to the following information. The speed of a sound wave in air depends on the air temperature. The formula above shows the relationship between a, the speed of the sound wave in feet per second, and t, the air temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So. Which of the following expresses the air temperature in terms of the speed of a sound wave? Basically, it's asking which of the following expresses T in terms of A. 
So to do this, you just got to rearrange the equation. Here I have a equals 1052 plus 1.08t. I subtract 1052 from both sides and divide both sides by 1.08t and I get this. So therefore the answer to 9 is A. For question 10 it asks at which of the following air temperatures will the speed of the sound wave be closest to 1000 feet per second? So the speed of the sound wave is A, so you know that A has to be equal to 1000, and the speed of the sound wave is also equal to 1052 plus 1.08t, so you can set uh, 1000 equal to 1052 plus 1.08t, subtract 1000 from both sides, divide both sides by 1.08, and you get T is equal to negative 48. And it's in Fahrenheit. So yeah, negative 48 degrees Fahrenheit. B is the answer. Question 11 asks, which of the following numbers is not a solution to this inequality? You basically just have to plug in every answer choice and see which answer choice doesn't work and the answer choice that does not work is a because you know 3 times negative 1 minus 5 is not greater than 4 times negative 1 minus 3 if you like you know solve it out yeah question 12 based on the histogram above of the following which is closest to the average arithmetic mean number of seeds per apple all right so the histogram shows, so for each number of, so it shows the number of apples and the number of seeds per each of the apples. So there are, so there are two apples that have three seeds. There are four apples that have five seeds. There is one apple that has six seeds, two apples that have seven seeds, and the three apples that have nine seeds. So you have three apples times two seeds plus five apples times four seeds. I mean, sorry, four apples times five seeds. Yeah, yeah. So you have three seeds times two apples per seed plus five seeds times four apples per seed and so on. And you get 73. And it asks which of the following is the average, closest to the average. So since there are 12 apples in total, you have 73 divided by 73 seeds divided by 12 apples and you and you get approximately 6 seeds per apple so the answer is C question 13 a group of 10th grade students responded to a survey that asked which math course they were currently enrolled in the survey data were broken down as shown in the table above which of the following categories accounts for approximately 19% of all the survey respondents so basically the total number of a survey respondents is 310 and which of the categories accounts for 19% of 310. So 19% of 310 is 0 0.9 is 0 0.19 times 310 which is 58.9 which is approximately equal to 59 because like it says like approximately so look for the category that contains uh, approximately 58.9 students, which is geometry male. Male is taking geometry. Answer is C. So these questions, uh, these questions uh, don't really involve much calculation per se, as they involve uh, understanding and comprehending the words. So question 14, the table above lists the length to the nearest inch of a random sample of 21 brown bullhead fish. The outlier measurement of 24 inches is an error. Of the mean, median, and range of the values listed, which will change the most if the 24 inch measurement is removed from the data? So for context, uh, in case you didn't know, the mean is the average arith arithmetic mean. The mean is where you take all of the values, add them together, divide by the to and then divide by the total number of values. The median is the middle value, like the value that is that where exactly half of the values are lower and half of the values are higher. And the range is the highest value minus lowest value. So mean and range, so like mean and median both take into account all of the values, but range only takes into account the lowest and highest value. So therefore the range will change the most. And it also, if you do the calculation, then you can find out, but you don't really have to do the calculation because like it should be intuition would tell you that C is the answer. 
But if your intuition doesn't tell you that, it's okay. You can just do the calculation and you'll find that the range changes the most. So questions of 15 and 16 refer to the following information. The graph displays the total cost C in dollars of rent and boat for H hours. H hours. What does the C intercept represent in the graph? So the C intercept is when H is equal to zero. When H is equal to zero, C is equal to five. And uh, basically when H is equal to zero, when zero hours of the boat is rented when the when the boat is rented for zero hours it costs five dollars so what that means is the in, is a the initial cost of renting the boat basically when you first rent the boat before you use it for any hours when you first rent it you've already paid five dollars and then for every hour you rent the boat you pay some more money so answer is a the initial cost of renting the boat before you use it for any number of hours 16 asks which of the following represents the relationship between h and c basically it's just asking you for the equation of this uh, of this line and the answer is c and so with a line the equation of a line is y equals mx plus b m being the slope and b being the y intercept which in this case is the c intercept the c intercept is a five as you can see this is five so you have plus five as this c intercept and the slope is the change in y when x changes by one so when x changes by one y changes by three so that's the slope so you have c the answer c being the correct answer question 17 the complete graph of the function f is shown in the xy plane above for what value of x is the value of f of x at its minimum so basically just find the point in this uh, in this uh, function at which at which y is the lowest so at what point in this function is y the lowest this point at this point y is the absolute lowest the minimum and what is and what is the value of x for the value of x x is equal what is it negative three of course so you can have to count from the origin zero negative one negative 2, negative 3. So the answer is B. 18 asks, in the xy plane, if a 0, 0 is the solution to the system of inequalities above, which of the following relationships between A and B must be true? So you have x is less than negative x plus a, and I mean, sorry, y is less than negative x plus a, and y is greater than x plus b. So there, and since you know that zero zero is the solution, that means that when x and y are both equal to zero, these inequalities are true. So substitute in zero for both x and y, and here you get zero is less than a, and then zero is greater than b. So since uh, since zero is less than a, that means a is positive. You know, a is greater than zero. A is positive. And since zero is greater than b, that means b is negative. Because you know, b is less than zero, so b is negative. Since a is positive and b is negative, that means a must definitely be greater than b. Because positive numbers are greater than negative numbers. The answer is a. 19. A food truck sells salads for six fifty each and drinks for two dollars each. The food truck's revenue from selling a total of two hundred nine salads and drinks in one day was eight hundred thirty six dollars and fifty cents. How many salads were sold on that day? Um, you can just use algebra to solve it. So first, set up an equation, an equation to find the total revenue. So you know the total revenue is this, so this is the right side of the equation. And the left side of the equation would be the total revenue in terms of uh, salads and drinks sold. So each drink is sold for $2, so you have D being the number of drinks sold times 2, the price per drink. And each salad is sold for six fifty. so you have S being the number of salads sold and the 6.5 being the price per salad. Now, you also know that the total number of salads and drinks combined sold is 209. 
So you have s plus d is equal to 209. And here I'm gonna and here you have a system of equations. You have this equation and you have this equation. So I'm gonna solve for d in terms of s, which d is 209 minus s. And then I'm gonna go back to this equation and knowing that d is equal to 209 minus s, I can substitute in 209 minus s for d and then I distribute and I end up getting s is equal to 93. So the answer is b. So for question 21, the data in the table above were produced by a sleep researcher studying the number of dreams people recall when asked to record their dreams for one week. Group X consisted of 100 people who observed early bedtimes, and group Y consisted of 100 people who observed later bedtimes. If a person is chosen at random from those who record at least one dream, what is the probability that a person belonged to group Y? So first of all, the person who is chosen at random has to be someone who recalled at least one dream. So we have to ignore this column, because in this column, the people record zero dreams. So you're only looking at this column and this column. These two columns are people who record at least one dream. Now, out of, so you have to take the number of people who, who were part of group Y and divide that by the total number of people in these two columns. So the number of people who belonged to group Y is 11 plus 68, and the total number of people in these two columns is 39 plus 125. So you end up getting 79 over 164, which that is the answer. The answer is C, 79 over 164. Now for question 20, Alma bought a laptop computer at a store that she gave a 20% discount off its original price. The total amount she paid to the cashier was P dollars, including 8% sales tax on the discounted price, which of the following represents the original price of the computer in terms of P. So basically N is equal to the, to the original price and P is equal to the price she paid. So basically I just have to undo the two price adjustments. The two price adjustments are the 20% discount and the 8% sales tax. Um, so I do the divide to undo the adjustments. Now to now 20% discount means that the price goes down by 20%. To go to bring a value down by 20%, you multiply by 0 0.8. 8% sales tax means the value goes up by 8%. So to bring a value up by 8%, you multiply by 1.08. So the answer is D. Questions 22 and 23 refer to the following information. The table above lists the annual budget in thousands of dollars for each of the six different state programs in Kansas from, 20, from 2007 to 2010. And uh, yeah. This graph shows the annual budget for each of these state programs for for these four years. Um, if you comprehend the graph, um, I mean, sorry, the table. Um, do you comprehend the table? Uh, anyway, um, either way, it's pretty easy. Like, how do I say this? It's the table. You don't really have to like look at all the data here, you can just go straight to the questions. So question 22 asks, which of the following best approximates the average rate of change in the annual budget for agriculture and natural resources in Kansas from 2008 to 2010? So the average, so from 2008 to 2010, what is the average rate of change in the annual budget for agriculture and natural resources? So you go here, agriculture natural resources and you take the value from 2008 which is this and the value from 2010 which is this and you subtract the value from 2008 from the value from 2010 so that's how you get the change in annual budget from 2008 to 2010 and it says per year since it says per year in the sense there are two years you divide by two to get a change per year which is this and keep in mind, it says in thousands of dollars. So you have to multiply by a thousand and you get approximately $65 million. The answer is B. Question 23, of the following, which program's ratio of its 2007 budget to its 2010 budget is closest to the human resources program ratio of its 2007 budget to the 2010 budget? So for this, you, you unfortunately just have to go through each, each uh, program 
each program's budget and uh, calculate their annual rate of change. I mean, I mean, so the ratio of the ratio of 2007 to 2010. Sorry, not annual rate of change. So you look through all of these programs, and uh, you just have to go through. So first, go to Human Resources and look at its ratio from 2007 to 2010. This ratio is approximately 0 0.6842. And then you look at the ratio from 2007 to 2010 for each of the other other programs and look at which program has the closest rate closest ratio. And the program that has the closest ratio is education. Um, the ratio of education from 2007 to 2010 is 2.1 million to 3 million, which is a 0 0.719, which is the closest to 0 0.684. Question 24. Which of the following is an equation for a of a circle in the xy plane with center 0, 4, and radius with endpoints 4 over 3 and 5? This may sound intimidating, and indeed it, and indeed it kind of is. However, you can easily solve it. So the equation of a circle is this. This is the equation of a circle, x minus the x-coordinate of the center of the circle, or that squared, plus y minus the y-coordinate of the center of the circle, or that squared, is equal to the radius of the circle squared. And you also have the distance of formula. So basically, you want to find the distance from the center of the circle to the end point, to this end point. So you use the distance formula, and you find that the, the distance between the center of the circle and the end point, this end point, is 1.66, or 5 over 3. And how you find that is that you have x um, the distance formula. So, you kn so um, yeah. So now, since you have the radius is equal to five over three, you can now proceed to find the radius squared, which is twenty-five over nine, which that is this part of the equation. So twenty-five over nine is equal to r squared. Now, for this, you have x minus the x-coordinate of the center squared plus y minus the y-coordinate of the center squared. The x-coordinate of the center is 0, so it's just x squared. And the y-coordinate of the center is 4, so it's y minus 4 squared. And there you have the equation for the circle. You have the answer, which is a. Question 25. The equation above expresses the approximate height h in meters of a bar t seconds after it is launched vertically upward from the ground with an initial velocity of 25 meters per second after approximately how many seconds would the bar hit the ground. So basically you just have to calculate when you have to calculate when h is equal to zero. h represents the height of the bar in terms of t, which is the time. So you just have to find when is h equal to zero. Well, you have z so you take this equation, you get zero equals a 4.9t squared plus 25t. It is time to use the quadratic formula. So, in the in so for the quadratic formula, you know it's this negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus a 4ac over all of that over 2a. Um, in this case, a is equal to 4.9, b is equal to 25, and c, there is no c, so it's 0. You substitute in a, b, and c, and you end up getting two answers. 0, you end up getting 0, and fifth, negative 50 over 9.8. So the thing is, 0, so you have two answers, 0 and negative 50 over 9.8, which is the uh, approximately equal to 5. Negative 50 over negative 9.8, sorry, not 9.8, negative 9.8, which is a pr pr approximately equal to 5. So the thing is, so the ball has a height of a 0 when t is equal to 0 and when t is equal to 5. However, 0 cannot possibly be one of your answers because 0 is before the ball is launched. It asks the uh, after approximately how many seconds after the bar is launched will the bar hit the ground. So your only possible answer is the time t 
when the ball is when the height is equal to zero after the launch, which is five, t equals five seconds. The answer is D. So these two problems, these word problems, are just super long and wordy. Um, she note so here. She studies the production of pears by two types of pear trees. So she noticed that type A trees produced 20% more pears than type B trees did. Now, based on Katrina's observation, if the type A trees produce 144 pears, how many pears did the type B trees produce? So the type B trees, so the type A trees produced 20% more pears than type B trees. So A being the number of pears produced by type A trees, B being the number of uh, pairs produced by type B trees, since type A trees produce 20% more pairs, A is equal to 1.2 times B, meaning that A is 20% is more than B. Now, you know that A is equal to 144, so you substitute that in for A, you divide both sides by 1.2, and you get B is equal to 120. That means type B trees produced 120 pairs. The answer is B. All right, here, a square field measures 10 meters by 10 meters. 10 students each mark off a randomly selected region of the field. Each region is square and has side lengths of one meter, and no two regions overlap. The students count the earthworms counted in the soil to a depth of five centimeters beneath the ground's surface in each region. The results are shown in the table below. Which of the following is a reasonable approximation of the number of earthworms to a depth of five centimeters beneath the ground's surface in the entire field? Basically, um, how do I say this? So, the square field measures 10 meters by 10 meters. And each student, each student counts the number of earthworms in a one, in the region, which is one meter, which has an area of one meter. So, each region that the stu that each student, uh, that each student selected has an area of one meter, and the total field is 100 meters, 10 times 10, 10 squared. So if you look at this table, you can see that the average number of earthworms per region is 150 earthworms, approximately 150. Approximately 150 is, is the average number of earthworms in per region. And since there are 100 regions in this field, you take 150 times 100, which is equal to 15,000. So the answer is C. If the system of inequalities y is greater than y being greater than or equal to 2x plus 1, and y being greater than 1 over 2x minus 1 is graphed in the xy plane above, which quadrant contains no solution to the system? So. Here, you could just uh, draw the two lines, the two inequalities, or you could solve it algebraically. I chose to solve, I chose to draw the two regions rather than solve them algebraically, even though you could. So y being greater than 2x plus, y being greater than or equal to 2x plus 1 would be this line, this line. And y being greater than 1 half x minus 1 would be this line. So if you don't know how to graph a line, a line giving a line given in this form is just a slope and intercept. You graph the y-intercept here and then you graph the slope. So yeah. Now y has to be greater than both of these these values. So for both of these lines, you take the region above the line. So the region that is above both of these lines. And as you can see, some of the region is in quadrant two, some of the region is in quadrant one, some of it is in quadrant three, but none of the region is in quadrant four. So the answer is quadrant four, C. So for question 29, for a polynomial P of X, the value of P of three is negative two, which of the following must be true about P of X. So, the answer choices are A, B, C, and D. Now, A, B, and C are not necessarily true, because like nowhere in this uh, nowhere in this uh, sentence does it even imply that A, B, and C are true. They they could be true, but they are not necessarily true. So D is the only possible answer, 
and ds also has to be true. And to verify this, you can craft this e equation. You can say you can set p of x equal to x minus three times q of x plus r, and q of x being the p of x, but like you know, with that done to it, and you can verify that when you divide both sides by x minus three you will end up getting the remainder is negative 2. Now, here's the thing. Question 29 is ridiculously hard, like extremely hard for an SAT problem. And this problem is like much higher level. And this isn't what you would expect on the SAT. So if you see this problem, do not be do not feel too do not feel too worried that you will see a problem this hard because question 29 is like actually super hard for an SAT problem and you don't have to expect as you don't have to expect SAT math problems to be this hard next problem which of the following is an equivalent form of the equation of the graph shown in the xy plane above, from which the coordinates of vertex A can be identified as constants in the equation? So, the answer is a, the answer is D. But why is the answer D? Well, basically, you have a parabola, and to graph a parabola, you the parabola's vertex, it says from which the coordinates of vertex A can be identified as constants in the equation. So this, this is the quadratic form of a parabola. This is one way to write a parabola. But a parabola can also be written as y equals, uh, in parentheses, x minus h squared minus k, I mean, plus k. So you can also write a parabola like that. So basically, h is the x-coordinate of the vertex, and k is the y-coordinate of the vertex. So the answer is d. And you can also verify you can like you can verify that these two equations are the same. Um, basically, in the equation d. It's, it says the coordinates of a vertex A can be identified as constants in the equation. So the coordinates of a vertex A are 1, negative 16. The x-coordinate of vertex A is 1. The y-coordinate of vertex A is negative 16. So you can identify the 1 and negative 16 in equation D. So D is the answer. Now the next eight answers are... The next eight answers are filling fill in so yeah now question 31 why it can husk at least 12 dozen ears of corn per hour and at most 12, 18 dozen corns of ear per hour based on this information what is the possible amount of time in hours that could take why to husk 72 dozen ears of corn so basically for why it the minimum doesn't the minimum ears of corn and, and by corn they go by dozens so the minimum ears of corn per hour is 12 and the maximum ears of corn per hour is uh, 18 and uh, it asks you how many hours would it take to husk 72 dozen ears so seven, 72 dozen ears over 12 12 ears so 72 dozen ears over 12 dozen years per hour equals six hours. Now, if you go by 18 out dozen years of corn per hour, you have 72 dozen years of corn over 18 dozen years of corn per hour. That means four hours to husk all of them. Now, this is actually an interesting question because in this question, the answer can be anything between four and six inclusive as in it, it includes the four and six so this is an interesting sat question your answer can be anything between four and six including four and six so yeah 
Question 32. The posted weight limit for a covered wooden bridge in Pennsylvania is 6,000 pounds. A delivery truck that is carrying X identical boxes, each weighing 14 pounds, will pass over the bridge. If the combined weight of the empty delivery truck and its driver is 4,500 pounds, what is the maximum possible value for X that will keep the combined weight of the truck, driver, and boxes below the bridge's posted limit? So, the... The posted limit is 6,000 pounds, and, and you have to be under the posted limit. You have to be under 6,000 pounds, under the posted limit of 6,000. And what is the combined weight of the delivery truck and the driver? Well, the combined weight of the delivery truck and the driver is 4,500 pounds, and each pound each, I mean, sorry, each box is a 14 pounds, and there are X boxes. Each box weighs a 14 pounds. So you can set up this equation. 4,500 is the weight of the truck and the driver. 14 is the weight uh, of each box, and X is the number of boxes. And this is the combined weight of the truck, driver, and boxes. This has to be less than 6,000. So you have this inequality. Subtract 4,500 from both sides and you get 14x is less than 1,500. Divide both sides by 14 and you get x is less than 107.1. And also you cannot have a fraction of a box. So the maximum possible value for x, the maximum possible value of boxes is 107. That is the highest number of boxes that you can have without exceeding the weight limit. And you can't have a fraction of a box. So the answer is 107. Question 33. According to the line graph above, the number of portable media players sold in 2008 is what fraction of the number sold in 2011? So in 2008, there have been 100 million sold. In 2008, 100 million portable media players were sold. In 2011, you have 160 million portable media players sold. So what is the fraction? So in 2008, 100. In 2011, uh, 160. So you just take the fraction, the ratio, the fraction, 100 over 160, and that equals 0 0.625, which is your answer. Question 34 says, a local television st station sells time slots for programs in 30-minute intervals. If the station operates 24 hours per day, every day of the week, what is the total number of 30-minute time slots the station can sell for Tuesday and Wednesday? So, 30-minute time slots. Basically, there are 24 hours per day. Like, yeah, there are 24 hours per day. And there are two time slots per hour, because, you know, each time slot is 30 minutes, so there are two, so two time slots would be one hour. And there are two days, Tuesday and Wednesday, so 24 times 2 times 2 is equal to 96, which is your answer. A dairy farmer uses a storage silo that is in the shape of a right circular cylinder above. If the volume of the silo is 72 pi cubic yards, what is the, what is the diameter of the base of the cylinder in yards? So, the volume of a cylinder is a pi r squared h, r being the radius of the base and h being the height and pi. So the volume is pi r squared h, and you know that the volume is 72 pi cubic yards, so 72 pi is equal to pi times 8, which is the height, 8 yards, times r squared. So, and keep in mind this is in yards. So divide both sides by pi and divide both sides by 8, you get 9 equals r squared. Take the square root of r squared, you get a 3 or negative 3, but it cannot be negative 3 because like you can't have negative like, you can't have, like, negative lengths, like, you know? So, 3, so R is 3. Now, the diameter is twice as long as the radius. The diameter is 2R, so diameter is 6. So, the diameter of the base of the cylinder is 6 yards. The answer is 6. Question 36. For what value of x is the function h above undefined? h of x is equal to 1 over all of this, 1 over 
x minus 5 squared plus 4 times x minus 5 plus 4. So in order for this to be undefined, h of x would be undefined if h of x is equal to 1 over 0, because you can't divide by 0. So therefore you have to find when is this. When is this the denominator of this expression equal to 0? So I set this equal to 0, I expand it out, and then I get this. I get x squared minus 6x plus 9 is equal to 0, and that can be rewritten as x minus 3 squared. I take the square root of both sides, x minus 3 is equal to 0, and therefore x is equal to 3, and that is my answer. Now, the last two questions refer to the following information. Jessica opened a bank account that earns 2% interest compounded annually. Her initial deposit was $100, and she uses the expression 100 times x to the t to find the value of the account after t years. What is the value of x in the equation? In the expression, sorry. So, she earns 2% interest every compounded every year and the t is the number of years. So 2% interest, that means her bank account goes up by 2% every year. And to increase a value, so after one year, the bank account goes up by 2%. It increases by 2%. So therefore, x has to be the value that you multiply to something to increase it by 2%, which is 1.02. Question 38. Jessica's a friend, to, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this name, found an account that earns 2.5% interest compounded annually. This name, I don't know how to pronounce, made an initial deposit of $100 into this account. At the same time, Jessica made a deposit of $100 into her, into her account. After 10 years, how much more money will, t I don't know how to pronounce this name, how much more money will he, his initial deposit have earned? How much more money will his initial deposit have earned than Jessica's initial deposit? And it says you can round your answer to the nearest cent. So, so t of t, now lowercase t is the time in years, and, the, and I write the function t of t, which is the number of dollars in Tishan. I think that's how I pronounce it. I'm not sure if I pronounce it right t, uppercase t of t, is the number of dollars in Tishan's bank account after t years. And the j of t is the number of dollars in Jessica's bank account after t years. Now you want to find the value of a c. So c is like in, so like what, what I do is I set the difference between Tishan's bank account and Jessica's bank, bank account. I set the difference between the two bank accounts values equal to C. Then Tishan's bank account is 100 times in parentheses 1.025 to the power of 10. Jessica's bank account is this. And I solve them. I solve these two. So I subtract. Uh, so I then make c, I isolate c, so I get a c is equal to the difference between Tishan and Jessica's bank account. You can plug all of this into a calculator and you get approximately 6.11. So the answer is six dollars and eleven cents. And yeah, conclusion, thank you for watching my SAT math practice test walkthrough slash tutorial. I hope my video helped you practice for the SAT. Um, I hope it helped you prepare for the SAT and I hope you learned something new and understand the math better now. If that's the case, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, hit the bell icon to never miss another upload, and if you have any lingering questions, feel free to leave a comment asking me anything, I will respond as quickly as possible. If you have any confusions or anything you need help with with the math SAT, feel free to just leave a comment asking me and I will respond as quickly as possible. Anyway, 
time for the end screen. For those of you who know my channel well, I am I know I am deviating from my usual videos. I should I usually post memes and gaming. This is because I am experimenting with different types of videos to see if I can get more views. And if my math tutorial videos do well, I'll upload more math tutorial videos. And if you're new to my channel, feel free to check out my gaming and meme videos. Anyways, thank you so much thank you so much for watching. This has been Charlie. If you made it to the end of this video, this means you definitely enjoyed it. So please hit the subscribe button, tap the bell icon to never miss another upload, uh, like this video, and leave a comment. Thank you. This has been Charlie. Until next time, take care.